everybody. That's pretty high. Okay. Just wanted to get the energy up real high. Um, welcome to my talk, Kubernetes Software Supply Kill Chains, the most clickbaity title I could come up with. Um, first, I want to appreciate uh, B Sides Buffalo. Number one, it's the first B Sides Buffalo ever, so give some appreciation for this. Second, I want you to check out my, my swag I got from the organizers. This is Hack the Planet. I've never seen swag like this. This is amazing. This is one of a kind, not just for Buffalo, but I don't, I literally never seen hacker swag that has any of this stuff. So, okay, let me, uh, let's dive into it. This is what I want to talk about today. Um, software supply chain case studies, I guess. Um, what has happened to software supply chain attacks in the past? Uh, we'll go through an actual uh, exploit, uh, a case study of, of Kubernetes compromising a container registry, backdooring a vault image, what actually ends up happening. We'll do all that stuff. Um, and then I'll go into more defense. Um, I was just mentioning, like, I guess, kind of, my, I'm in the phase of my career where I'm doing a lot more defensive stuff, like how do we solve this stuff as an industry. So we'll go into, uh, you know, how to defend yourself from getting solar winded uh, this year and why you should be specifically concerned. So my name is Mark Manning. I go by Antitree on Twitter, if anybody uses Twitter anymore. Uh, I work at Snowflake right now, doing a bunch of everything, sandbox, Kubernetes stuff. Um, I used to work at a company called NCC Group, where I ran a container practice, just exploiting um, anything that had containers in it. If it's Kubernetes or Docker, or if it was a car literally running Kubernetes in the dashboard, uh, we could work on that. So I've got a bias towards like, this is kind of my career in the last five years. I would just be like, containers are bad. And people are like, yeah, I know, do something else. I'm like, oh shit, Kubernetes is bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am from Rochester. Anybody from Rochester? I should, yeah. Yeah, okay, rep. Um, I, I started the security b size Rochester with, it, with a bunch of other people. Um, we have Rochester 2600. So I like this idea of like this Western New York uh, uh, linking up communities here. So this has been great. So this is your software supply chain, I hope. Um, in the best case scenario, you've got developers that send your organization a bunch of code. Code goes into a place like, I don't know, GitHub, GitLab, whatever. You've got some, maybe you're using like SVN still or Mercurial, I don't know. Um, the code gets stored there. We build the code. Maybe you've got some Golang thing that gets compiled during that build phase. There's a bunch of dependencies that get resolved, right? Like these are the third party libraries and these are the other like third party developers that are doing stuff that you don't really know, but it's getting baked into your, to your build process. And then the packaging refers to like any kind of delivery of like, maybe it's a packaging of a container image to uh, uh, you know, a Docker image registry, or maybe it's just dumping it to an S3 bucket that you trust or you know, packaging an RPM into a yum repo. It's like, that's, it's like where do the artifacts get stored? And then consumers are, uh, you know, if, it's, if it's internal, it's your internal consumers or your, your internal production that's running your code, or if you've got an open source software stuff, it might be a whole bunch of other people. So why are we going after software supply chain in the last couple of years? Like, why are attackers doing it and why are pen testers doing it now too? Um, the old way would be like, hey, let's compromise an EC2 instance. And that kind of was cool, but Things are getting more ephemeral and we can't really maintain state. We don't keep those back doors as long as we used to. And I used to get messages all the time about like, hey, I've got a shell in a, in a Kubernetes pod. And first of all, I'd be like, why are you sending this message over SMS? This is totally illegal. Uh, you're going to get me in trouble. And second of all, I'd be like, good luck. What are you going to do from there? That pod is going to turn over really quick, like probably lives for like an hour if you're lucky. And from there, it's not like you can easily pivot and escalate and take over the, take over the whole box. So uh, attackers are going for more persistent stuff. They're going after your supply chain. Uh, they can be per persistent for years. They're not exploitable with ODAs. You're not dropping some like, you know, crazy Jenkins ODA. You're just going like, oh, it's Jenkins. I exploited it because it's Jenkins. Um, and it's not just like your organization. It could be all the other organizations that you're a dependency for, right? So this is really what your supply chain looks like. It's all these opportunities uh, for different exploits at different phases. And then as you scale with the different dependencies and so many different authors, that kind of increases the, the, uh, uh, the risk to your organization. Because I think a lot of you have probably taken that SANS course that says, hey, when my AWS account gets compromised, here's what we do. We go into the battle room and we, we do all this plan and like, okay, let's do this, guys, and we're going to have instant response. And then like 
What do you do when you compromise Jenkins? You just go, I guess, this. <laughs> Too early for a suicide joke, sorry. Uh, uh, EINSA is saying that there's 400% increase in supply chain threats. Uh, I mean, you can just look at the news and kind of feel that vibe. 650% increase year over year supply chain threats. If you don't feel like that's, that's accurate, you're wrong. So we're, all we're seeing is like different supply chain threats. We will say that like this is biased because we've been calling things different stuff back in 2015 than we have now. So I would say that like things are getting labeled as supply chain threats when they weren't before. I used to try to make a slide of like, hey, let's look at the timeline of all these different supply chain threats back to 2017 and, and let's just do it like in the past like two months because it's easier to consume. Um, in April, we had people that were protesting uh, the Russian war and they would, they would on purpose uh, backdoor their own code. So node IPC, event source, they added in uh, a malicious stuff that would say like, I'm gonna look at the IPs that are using my, uh, my code and I'm going to like uh, either kill it or I'm gonna do some backdoor into it and do some kind of protest to execution. Um, the fixed crash stuff, there was this one dependency in NPM called fixed crash. It affected like over 500 different uh, uh, packages that, that would try to specifically steal Discord creds. We removed it eventually after it was there for like a year. Uh, then there's all these typo squatting. Right? We know typo squatting, it's just the idea of like, I've got something named like dist utils is a legitimate one. And someone goes out there and like, I'm gonna make dist util. If anybody ever looks for dist util, it's gonna run mine. But that was running in uh, PyPI for, for like at least six months that would uh, backdoor all of your code. VMware had a dependency confusion where uh, the internal name that they're using for the packaging was also hosted on GitHub. They accidentally resolved it to the external maliciously hosted version of the package and they uh, uh, backdoored vSphere. There's a bunch of Kafka stuff that happened in the last couple months. Um, the, Somebody took the, so the, the Cara, Cara Pace, whatever package, was just non-existent in PyPI. There was a legitimate one on GitHub, and then they said, well, I'm just gonna take the code from GitHub and I'm gonna host it in PyPI, but I'm gonna modify it and backdoor it. And there's no way to say like, okay, this is the code that was on GitHub, this must be the legitimate code that's on PyPI. So someone just hosted the malicious version on PyPI and said it was hosted on, on GitHub. So that's just like literally a clone. SpeedyTS, compiler, this one is funny because it was like an ethical hacker, quote unquote, that would just, um, when it ran, it would pull down another package as a dependency, and that package was empty, it was blank. And you go like, what, was they, what were they doing? And all they were doing is trying to steal your IP address so they could, so they could write like a cool like presentation slide of like, look at how many IPs I've, uh, are running my malicious code. Um, I, I don't feel like that's very ethical, <laughs> I don't know why. I guess he didn't do anything malicious, but, but what a dick move. Um, <laughs> CTX, PHPass, um, this was, uh, one was Python, one was PHP, obviously. The entire repos got compromised. Somebody was uh, targeting specific uh, users, just stole the repos and blocked them out from being able to modify their own code. Uh, and, and they ran them to, uh, to steal credentials when anyone used this stuff. Same thing with um, uh, Pi Kafka. That was fun because they, they put in a full uh, Cobalt Strike backdoor when you did a, a typo squad of Pi Kafka instead of Pi Mafka, which just seems, I don't know who's, who's typo squatting that one. And then one of my favorite ones is, it's because it's named. There's a typo squatted one for Rust Decimal that was hosted on Crate.io, but they named it Crate Depression. Like I just love that there's a named uh, like exploit just called Crate Depression. Vendors can't solve this, unfortunately. They might tell you that they can. There's uh, stuff out there that can help, but you have to kind of lean into uh, solving this yourself. You're not gonna uh, accept a pill, right? So here's a poll. Um, we're trying to figure out like how many people are investing in supply chain security stuff this year. So there's, there's three options. The first one is like, how many of you are, your company or your, the people that you work for um, plans to invest in software supply chain threat mitigation this year. Well, that is dire. Okay, a couple in the back. All right. How many are, like, your work is concerned about it and they're thinking about it, but they're probably not going to do anything this year? Okay. 
And then how many are just like npm install YOLO security <laughs> stuff? Yeah, it's, I know. You don't don't raise your hand. It's fine. I know it's everybody else. Um, there's like six categories of attack. If you follow CNCF, when you're trying to talk to like the business of like what what do we defend from, I like that it broken down this way of here's here's where previous attacks have happened. Here's how we can defend against them. So the dev tooling is is uh, is one I like where your like development environment is completely compromised. They steal your credentials. They own the box that you're writing code on, or like they own the tools that you use to write the code, like VS Code, you know. Um, source code just means like anytime you compromise anything related to the source code. The source code repo, um, modifying the source code like bef while it's being built. Can I upload malicious stuff into the source code? Uh, and then negligence is just this bucket of everything else. Like it's almost always negligence in some way of just like there was some probably some best practice that you were supposed to do but you didn't do it. Um, trust and signing refers to stuff like, okay, hey, I'm doing signing. I'm like signing this artifact. I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm putting effort into this thing. And then I've got this, you know, private public key pair. And then you go, oops, my private key was exposed in the whole thing because I don't really understand how to, you know, protect my signing stuff. And there's been a lot of mistakes there. Like if you can imagine you've signed your commits, but then you just keep your, your, uh, you know, commit key on your desktop that, that is, you know, unprotected. So there's not a lot of value in that stuff. The infrastructure itself will show some demos today of like, what if you just compromise like the S3 bucket? And what if you get rewrite access to the, the publishing infrastructure? When you do the, the actual release of the code, can you compromise that? And then the most interesting one, of course, is like the malicious maintainer. Somebody that just becomes malicious and like gets turned over or like for 20 bucks just sells you his project, right? And then you can just use that uh, to, to do supply chain attacks. Has anybody heard of Salsa? SLSA, okay. This is this is like if you take nothing away from the presentation, this is the thing that's going to be the metric for how secure your supply chain environment is. And all it does is give you these maturity levels. So it's the software supply, uh, or the, it's the supply chain levels for software artifacts. And all it is is four levels that say here's how secure my software supply chain is. And it's not specifically like NIST guidance that says like go do this, you know, configure Jenkins this way. It's just like Here's at a high level what we expect from the supply chain. Good luck going to solve these things. Where level one is just literally, you get level one by just knowing how things execute. And like that is a big task actually for, for uh, companies that have been around for a while. Just like what, how do things get built in a consistent way? Build things that are tamper resistant. Can I sign things? Can I actually be sure that the thing's built that wasn't been modified? Um, or is it just doing like apt get install from random repos and curl bash and everything? Three is like audibility of having a, a log of everything that happened, having provenance, like going back and proving that the binary that I'm running over here in production matches the source code that I started with. That is a, 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 a large feat to, to try to work on. And then level four is like, you know, the rest of the owl. It's like, I need two-party review, I need hermetic build, I need a re reproducible build. Don't over-index on level four. I don't know anybody that's doing it besides the people that got actually solar winded, like solar wind. Um, they invested so much resources into having all the extra stuff to, uh, to defend against this stuff. I like Salsa because it helps you rationalize it to business. It can help you talk to the business in a consistent way. Uh, it helps you measure over time because the thing you're going to have problems with is, okay, I've secured CI or I've secured my bill, I've secured uh, my source code, but each one of them are different projects. And if, you're, if your organization is big enough, they're probably different teams. And to try to measure how all the teams are doing in a consistent way, like there's no point in just saying like, oh, I secured source and then my supply chain is good, or I secured packaging and my supply chain is good. You have to get them all kind of moving at the at the same time, and that's the game. So it boils down to this: like these are the four. This is the table. This is this is all salsa is right there. Um, you can match up like what you have to the level that you're required at. So also one, two, three, and four. And for each one of their different categories, where like the North Star is for source code, um, your commits are signed, you've got two-party review, you've got a full history of your source code. That's it. For build, it's like you need a build service. If it's Jenkins, I'm sorry. I'm going to beat up a lot on Jenkins, so just get used to it. If it's Jenkins, that's what you got to do. If it's like GitHub Actions, um, it's whatever you have a build service. You can reproduce the same artifact when you run through uh, a job twice. Can you get the same, you know, checksums after the whole thing? 
It shouldn't have access to the internet. It should be isolated from everything. That's the goal. Providence is, is, is again like all the dependencies that you have, that you have to bake in. You know where they came from. You know the version that they came from. They're not just, you know, you know the, the latest tag. And they can be traced throughout the whole source code from beginning of your, your source all the way to uh, the compilation of your artifact. And then there's just this common bucket that says like do security, access control, you know, make sure there's no super users. Like, yeah, okay, we need to do all this stuff and, and hopefully you're already doing the best practices, but it's kind of hand, hand wavy at the end, but it's also, also important to say like Jenkins needs to be secure and needs to be configured correctly. So we'll go through a couple case studies. Um, this is your environment. This is like the, the first step of this case study. And at the end, I'm, I'm going to describe this thing and then I'm going to ask you if you can figure out like which one I'm talking about, if anybody's paying attention to like, the latest attacks. So this one was uh, an attacker owned a Docker file because static credentials were baked into the Docker file. It was using uh, intermediary layers to build the Docker file. So you can set up a Docker file to say like, okay, I'm building Nginx, but like before that or after that, I can kind of have a separate container that goes down like pulls credentials or does some like previous stage and then you can copy things in between them. But what they found was like there was a there was a stage an intermediary stage that had all the credentials for the bucket and when you execute the the build you can go back up and say hey give me the credentials. So long story short they stole the credentials to the packaging of the bucket so it gave them read write access because these were the credentials that after the thing was created, after the thing was, was compiled, the image was compiled, it would upload to um, like a, just an S3 bucket or, or a Google bucket. With that, they modified the installer script, which was just a bash script. And everybody, and then they told all their users uh, to install this software, just curl bash uh, this command, just copy and paste this into your terminal, everything will be fine. It goes out to this bucket and installs everything, runs this, this installer script. This also backdoors the update script. Um, so compromise everybody that's using this software. Does anybody know what software that was, what compromise that was? This is um, uh, one called CodeCov. CodeCov was a, develop, uh, a dev tooling thing that a bunch of uh, VS Code users were using. That was like an IDE thing. They would just run in the background saying like, oh, this is this thing that would resolve a whole bunch of like code for me. So this impacted uh, over 2 million users of, of code code folks that if they were running this code, all of it was getting backdoored and all of it was getting, uh, uh, was getting owned. So how do you fix this? It's easy to say like we stole credentials and we just compromised the stuff. So like between like tactical solutions and, and, and strategy solutions, you go tactical stuff is just like don't curl bash, don't tell your developers to curl bash and don't put secrets in your Docker files, obvious, but we know developers, we know that they're going to do that. Um, how do we solve this uh, from the actual supply chain level? The, the kind of goal here is artifacts authenticity, signed artifacts, proving that like I've got a thing that I build, my image is built, my installer script was built from this environment, I sign it, so whatever, wherever I put it and whatever credentials uh, uh, the, 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 that somebody might have to put the thing there, they still don't have the key that signs that. So there should be a separate, like, we'll talk about this in a second, what cosign means. But there should be a signing process that just says, like, I can verify the integrity of this thing and tell, you, tell your users to do that. And then there's build providence of just, uh, okay, so there's, there's a signature, but a signature just says, like, I had the key at one time and I, 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 I signed the thing. But the build providence says, here's what happened in the build. Here's where the build came from. When someone just downloads install at sh, they have no idea where it previously came from. They can't really say like, oh, it went through this build environment, it went through this, these users. So if you take nothing else away, take this one away. Like, you could drive home right now, you could in, uh, download Cosign, and you could verify all of your code, all of your container images in like less than an hour. Um, Cosign is, is a project from SigStore. It lets you um, specifically do OCI images, but it can really handle any kind of binary that you want. You can do like just basically build an image, um, generate a key pair, and then sign the thing. Um, you can bake it into GitHub Actions. Like if you go into the, the, the marketplace right now, you can get a uh, GitHub Action that has all this stuff baked in where you just install it. You load the private key into your, your GitHub Action source. You run the thing, all it does is say like, okay, here's the cosign key, sign the thing, and everything is done. Everything else is kind of taken care of for you. There's a lot of hand wavy stuff where I'm going like, how is the password store and the private key? But like, let's just say like you can sign the thing and you get authenticity like out of the box. 
And what I'm saying is like an hour, it's probably even less. Like if you go to GitHub Actions and you say install the cosign installer today, you can get everything signed and you can have all of your releases signed uh, without like even paying attention to how you're configuring it. So this other case study is um, there's the goal here is I want to do some like typo squatting. And what I'm going to do is first go find some famous developer and I'm going to spoof their GitHub profile. So it looks like I'm actually their developer. And I've done this before in like phishing exercises. You go find someone famous that everyone trusts, spoof, spoof their account, make it look like you're uh, actually the developer, and then go out and typo squat uh, whatever package you want and just host it there and say like, hey, this is from this legitimate developer. And in this case, they went so far as, um, uh, as, as saying like, here's the stars in my repos and they're copying over like the resume of, of the developer. And what was interesting about this is not just a normal typo squat, the, the typo backdoor, typo squat backdoor had a check for the environment variables that when it ran, it would try to see, am I in uh, a build environment? Am I in like GitLab specifically? And it checks to say like, okay, it looks like I'm going through a build process. Now is when I'm going to inject a backdoor. So it says like, okay, environment variables say like GitLab underscore. I'm going to go up to a C2. I'm going to download an extra stage and I'm going to inject a, a, a malicious stage into whatever you're building. It only did this, like if you were doing like static analysis, all you're seeing is that like there's code that's checking the environment variable and there's like an if statement that says if this, then you know, make a, a URL request which makes it much harder to analyze than as opposed to like just baking the entire stage uh, into the execution. So this backdoor is all the builds and note that like it's backdooring all the builds that are using this as a dependency. It's not like their builds get backdoored. It's whoever uses, it, uses this as a dependency, their, back, their environment gets backdoored. Somebody found this just by accidentally looking at like the names of the packages and the people that were there. And instead of like Mark, it was Mark with a K, it was like Mark with a C. And somebody just dove into it and found that this has been going on for the past like uh, six months. So this is another another recent one. Does anybody uh, created a, a payload as, uh, to execute it? Does anybody know what this one was from? This one I'm, I mentioned before. Yeah, this is like literally two weeks ago. It's, it's not really fair. Um, uh, this was the, uh, uh, the the crate depression one. This was where somebody actually, uh, if you're not from the Rust community, you're gonna like I don't care. This is, uh, somebody made something malicious in crate.io and was hosting all this stuff, doing all these other things. So how do you solve this? Uh, going back to Salsa, it's hermetic builds. Hermetic means like, can't connect to the internet during build. Like, why does your build have to go and curl something down? Why is it even going up to yum? Like, all that stuff should be centrally managed. Um, having approved dependencies, like, is so critical. Like, these two things are, are really simple to do relatively. If you buy Artifactory, if you buy Nexus, if you buy like whatever, like an S3 bucket that just says here's the approved dependencies that we, we support as a company, um, you mitigate this risk of typo squatting by like, you know, 80%. The other thing that helps this is like having an isolated build between release and between uh, development or testing, whatever you want to do. We should not be like have the opportunity we can just blur the two. Like if I compromise the build environment, you shouldn't be able to compromise my production release. If you compromise my testing stuff and staging, it shouldn't uh, affect our release. And tactically, if you just want to do this stuff, there's companies that, that support this, right? Sneak, X-Ray from Artifactory. Has anybody use Phylum? Heard of Phylum? Phylum is a, a, a threat intelligence company that's just going back and doing like dependency analysis on like GitHub uh, uh, open source projects. So they would be like, you give them a pile of dependencies and they'll just go do research on like how sketchy their GitHub looks. Like, did they suddenly get a whole bunch of uh, uh, people that are, are, contr are contributors from China or from Russia in the last two weeks? Okay, that's a red flag, but kind of an interesting product. So how do you pull some of this stuff off? Um, when we say isolated builds, it means from like every, every angle. How about, anybody heard of Spiffy Inspire? Have you heard of that one? This is used under Istio if you're using Kubernetes. It's a way of doing like workload identity. So you can say, okay, when, when my build executes, it gets a service token that it can only access this S3 bucket for an hour. It can only push to these things for like 15 minutes. It can only perform these functions. And you can use this to, to um, isolate at the um, secrets level, at the network level, the identity level, the cloud level. And this ends up being like uh, ways to isolate uh, builds from 
because the litmus test for me is like, can a pen tester escalate from your dev pipeline into your release pipeline? You're going to hire somebody this year and you're going to point them at your Jenkins or your GitHub actions and they're going to completely own your infrastructure because you don't have strong tenancy controls and you're probably reusing secrets across these two accounts. Um, this happens time and time again. The other one is for Salsa 3, they want you to have strong uh, dependency controls. So I mentioned uh, like Artifactory, but just having an agnostic policy that you can say, okay, these are the dependencies that I want. Um, I don't want these ones. These are the specific versions. Open policy agent is a way of just making up a policy that says, here's the list of uh, approved uh, vendors that I want to support. And this can be used for anything, really. This can be used for dependencies. This can be used for a control to say, like, I don't want my, um, my dev environment to accidentally get sent into production. Like that, that can totally plausibly happen. And uh, OPA can kind of uh, make that control. Other solutions, uh, Artifactory can do this. Sneak kind of has a built in. GitHub can do this. And then there's these last two I'm going to talk about of like Tekton. Tekton and Tekton Chains. Um, Tekton is a CI system that is built on Kubernetes, of course, and it's all uh, container isolated. So when you run a single job, like, you know, compile this code, it's its own uh, container. It gets burned, it gets deleted, it just, you know, it's just a container for that, for that lifetime. There's a lot of cool security properties that you get out of that. And then Tekton Chains takes that idea and it says like, okay, for each of the different containers that run, I'm going to have a log of what happened in the previous stage in the previous container. And, and this is how I'm going to kind of control what happens. So you can say, okay, um, this is just like a Golang binary. Let's compile it in this image. It comes out with this artifact. Here's the SHA of the artifact. Here's the SHA of the container that ran the image. So now like you go to IR and you say like, hey, I think we've got an incident. You can go back and say like, well, here's the SHA of all the things that were used to compromise this thing. And you have an actual like, you know, chain in your supply chain. This is trying, I'm trying to uh, describe like the isolation that Tekton Chains provides. Once it's in Kubernetes, you can start making containers for every separate thing here and you can start mounting the storage in between. I can't, like, again, if, if you can, if you haven't chosen an, a CI today, uh, Tekton Chains from, from Google is probably going to be the future. So this is your, your, your last, I guess, case study that we're going to go through. The step one is you own a developer. Not that that would ever happen. Like we have so much security, and we're, our developers are so smart. But we compromised um, their credentials, and they have access to a dev and staging environment. We didn't give them access to prod, but they have access to a dev uh, staging credentials um, to access specifically like a, a container image registry. Turns out though that uh, we have actually created only one single container registry. We use that for dev and for prod. So when we give read-write access to the container registry, we actually mean you get read-write access to the production container registry. So now an attacker has access to write something into the container registry, do something malicious, um, and they just need to build a backdoor of a malicious container and push it up to the package uh, a repo, replace a known good image, and uh, backdoor all the deployments. So this one's cheating. This doesn't actually exist. This is one I made up because we're going to kind of like go into exactly uh, what this means. So this is a, a Kubernetes kind of supply chain attack I wanted to show you. How many people here use Kubernetes? Okay, okay, so I can never tell who's here for the supply chain, who's here for the Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is like the one that won the orchestration war, right? Like everybody's using Kubernetes, we just accept it. Um, it's most cloud native environments are using Kubernetes in some way. Probably most of them are using a bunch of stuff that they don't know about, like they don't know that they need. Like, do they need high availability stuff? Like, no, it's like sometimes it just ends up, you get thrown at Kubernetes. Um, this is just, for this talk, it's just like the output of a supply chain attack. We're not gonna go too deep into Kubernetes. And if you're interested in securing Kubernetes on the left, production Kubernetes, and on the right, like breaking and, and hacking into Kubernetes, uh, you'll, you'll see me in that book, actually. But for the sake of discussion, like this is your Kubernetes cluster. It's, it's nodes. The blue things are supposed to be pods. The orange things are supposed to be like the control plane, right? So the, the nodes and the, and the pods are just managing your workloads, but each one of those pods contains a container. And for our discussion, it's a container image. So maybe you're running like a web server with Nginx. It's got Istio sidecar, it's got a vault sidecar, but there's like three containers inside of your pod. 
whenever you want to start a node, or sorry, whenever you want to start a pod, it's going to go out and say, like, okay, I need this container image. I'm going to need to pull this down from someplace. And it goes back to a Docker container registry. Now let's see what happens when we own the, the container registry. So the first step of this was we need to compromise a dev. Let's just say like we've gotten on their, on their box. We now have read write credentials. Um, and we can use these credentials to work across dev and prod. Why this is like a realistic attack scenario is because this happens like 50% of the time to me when I was on pen testing. Um, there's a bunch of reasons that you get image registry credentials. It could be you gave uh, developers access and their accounts were compromised. Okay, that's kind of what's happening here. The creds were exposed because they got uploaded to some source repo. Because you go like, well, I need this build job. I'm just going to bake in the credentials into there. Um, the secrets get stored directly in a build job. You've got some Gradle script that just has the straight you know, credentials exposed in there. And, but my favorite one, and this is the one that happens most often, is you've got a Kubernetes environment that says, oh, well, we want to use a private registry. I'm going to give them um, credentials to access my registry. I'm going to use this image pull secrets thing. And then you accidentally said, like, well, they only need pull. But nine times out of ten when, when a developer has set this up, they've always given me push and pull. They've given me read write access. So this has always been like a great pivot point that you could just uh, push secrets back up there. So we've got registry creds, and we're going to go and build a backdoor. Um, we need to figure out like what kind of malicious backdoor we should build. Um, anybody use Vault? Anybody heard of Vault? Okay, yeah. Vault's like the the kind of standard um, like cloud agnostic or, or or how we want to think about it secrets engine. By default, Kubernetes has this you know they call them secrets, but they're just base64 encoded strings that they hold for you in an etcd uh, database. Vault secrets are a lot more configurable. You can kind of control around policies and when you get the secrets. And um, it's the more secure solution between the two. So I've seen this a lot uh, just used as like the secrets engine that everybody uses. What's fun, you don't really need to know about Vault, but just understand this is Vault has a whole bunch of modes that it runs in. There's a init container that starts up with a pod. There's a sub, there's like a sidecar that can run with your pod. There's the server that actually stores all your secrets. but it doesn't matter, it's all the same image. So if we were backdooring one single image, we get actually three different functions that we can backdoor. So that's what we're going to uh, invest our time in. So backdooring secrets, the Dan Kaminsky method. I'm backdooring using DNS. Um, I'm taking the HashiCorp vault source code and I'm recompiling it with this uh, Exodus uh, uh, library, which is just a custom DNS client and a custom DNS server. So you make a resolution and it'll send out, it'll exfil uh, all this data back to your uh, custom DNS server, which is legit. If anybody wants to go and do a DNS resolution on xfil.ioioio.cz, that's my server, uh, you'll get some interesting responses. If you want random IP addresses, that's what it'll return. So the whole point is that what I'm trying to configure this is when Vault accesses a secret, I'm going to steal it and I'm going to make a DNS request to exfil uh, the data back out to me. Why am I doing it this way? Um, Number one, uh, like Kubernetes always has a DNS server built into it, and it's usually named like kube-dns. So you get Kubernetes, you get a DNS server out of the box. It has to be there. It's just always going to be there. Uh, it ends up being like a critical service. So you have to run this thing. You know, you know where it is. You know how to access it. So you can even statically bake in, like do a DNS re resolution to this server. The other nice thing about this is. If you've got like an egress control, like, okay, I'm preventing this service from going out and accessing uh, the internet directly. Um, you, I guarantee you're not preventing DNS exfil, or at least uh, you're not logging in enough to, to prevent this stuff. So this is, this is the code. Uh, it just basically says like read a certain path where the secrets are and then send it back home. So we've got, we've compromised the dev account, we've built a backdoor, now we're onto the stage of like, let's replace uh, the actual uh, vault image on the repo, which should be straightforward. Um, you can do this with just Docker push. You can just say like, okay, I've got credentials. It's Docker push. It's done. But I want to highlight this tool for anybody doing pen testing and red team stuff. Um, this is a statically compiled um, binary that lets you interface just with container registries. So the best case scenario is like, okay, you've got remote code execution. You've got a shell on like a Kubernetes uh, pod. And you go, well, I'm not installing Docker to be able to push an image to a container registry. I just want to curl down some binary that's statically compiled that lets me interface with the registry 
And that's what Scopio is. It's not designed to be a malicious tool, it's just like the most useful tool for this stuff. So you can say, okay, container registry, give me all the list of uh, uh, images that are on your, uh, uh, inside the registry, uh, copy down whatever image that you want. And the more interesting one, of course, is like Scopio, uh, forget TLS, copy down uh, or copy up the whatever image I've created and overwrite uh, another existing tag. So like, th this is the crux of it is like a container registry is a, an extremely simple beast. Uh, it's just like block storage and an API. It does no verification of like what you're giving it or like where the thing is that, that you want to put it. So when you overwrite something and you just say like, hey, I'm going to build Nginx on my local box and I'm going to overwrite Apache on the remote box, the container registry doesn't care at all. It's just going to be like, yeah, sure, that's fine. It's blocks. I'll just, I'll just hold it for you and you can get it later. So this is, this is uh, the, the crux of what I'm about to do because all we can do, all we need to do is um, build my uh, vault binary uh, that has a backdoor with the Exodus DNS stuff in there, rebuild the uh, Docker container and uh, take that binary that I, just, that I just had and bake it back in. And then you do a Scopio copy, take the uh, SolarWinds creds that I've got there and then send it back up and overwrite the existing one that's named Vault Cates. And it's going to say, sure, I don't care. You've got credentials to, to do whatever you want. I'm, I'm going to allow you to overwrite. So we're at the phase of, okay, we've compromised the dev, we've compromised, built the back door, and we can bypass the CI CD because we just directly wrote to the container registry without having to go through CID. And now we're going to inject the sidecar. So it looks kind of like this if we summarize it. It's like Vault's back door, we push to the registry. It's stored in the cluster in the registry, it's accessible there. And then new deployments, whenever they execute, they're gonna take down this new vault image every single time they go to deployment because you're using the latest tag. And uh, all the secrets, as soon as they're accessed, get sent back to my server. So let me just show you kind of how that works. Oh, before I do that, side note, like, yes, I wrote all this stuff, and yes, it's currently hosted on Docker Hub. So like, in itself is a supply chain attack that no one has taken down yet, so I'm just kind of waiting for that. So kind of a meta, it's a supply chain talk and, and it's actually an attack happening right now. So this is, I'm just gonna run like, here's the web server that I'm running. I've got this web app that if I curl the web app, what it's gonna do is access a secret when I access it, like the web page, like, cause the, in the back end, Nginx needs to read the secret. And at the time that it gets accessed, Vault will say like, oh, hey, I see that you're trying to access the secret. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna, hope, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of DNS resolution and send it back to my uh, DNS server that's at the bottom. So this is the way to, to backdoor all of uh, Vault server, all of Vault sidecars. Anytime anyone accesses or touches any secret inside of your Kubernetes cluster, it'll now phone home to me. How do you fix this? Um, we talked about cosign. We can sign images. If there was a signed image, I wouldn't have been able to, you wouldn't have been able to like to run the thing. You wouldn't have been able to to execute the, the image in the first place. I wouldn't have been able to make the back door because I wouldn't have had the, the signed uh, uh, key. I wouldn't have had the key to sign. Uh, and it doesn't have any provenance. We don't have a build log of how the image was built. There's no way for like the Kubernetes cluster to say like, oh, where did this image come from? You just kind of said like, hey, it came from this container registry that my, that my cluster trusts. I'm gonna use that because I don't know, I trust that, that container registry, but you don't know what's actually on that registry. Uh, again, we should isolate dev and release, that, that would help, but this one is, is kind of most important. We have to trust artifacts, not where they're from. We, a lot of times, we'll trust like an S3 bucket because we own the S3 bucket, or we'll trust the image registry because it's the one that we configured, but we have no idea what's actually being stored there at the time of like pulling down the thing. This is the kind of the crux of the zero trust models. Like we need to be able to verify what happened in all the previous stages right at the point of runtime and not care about the thing that it came from or their IP address or the host name. Like those are really weak uh, trust models. And then there's like tactical stuff, right? Like yell at your administrators for even having like this thing set up in the first place so that you can have like dev and prod mixed together. Uh, there's an important one of like blocking public DNS resolution. So let me just talk about that one really quick because I don't know any organization that's doing this today, but this is how you can do it. Right now, you can do DNS exfil on any Kubernetes cluster, and I would recommend it because this is the cleanest uh, way to exfil stuff out, even if there's some kind of egress control. No one's paying attention to this stuff. By default today, 
if you look in your Kubernetes cluster, it's going to have that line right there. It says forward dot to Etsy resolve .conf. So like use whatever the host has for in its resolve .conf to, to uh, uh, do DNS resolutions. I mean, that's super useful. Sometimes it needs to have access to the internet. That's reasonable. But you can configure this to say like, okay, I don't want external resolution or I want to uh, like stub out exactly the upstream servers so that I can log them extra and I can have like some, you know, when it goes to the host, when it, when it constantly resolves like xfill.ioio.cz, it kind of feels like a red flag. So having some log and some record that you can kind of do threat detections on uh, would be nice. So this is how you do it. You can stub out, just make a, a config map inside of Kubernetes, tell it which stub domains you want to use, or set an upstream name server. And I was having a conversation with the threat detection folks um, last week, and they kind of gave me the idea that you could also set an upstream name server uh, that's kind of like a, a canary DNS server or a honey honey pot, where like if anything ends up resolving with this thing, it should be a red flag because why is why is your Kubernetes cluster suddenly doing external DNS resolution when it doesn't need to? So securing this thing, I, I told you about there's cosign, which will sign an image, will sign a, a whatever you want, but I didn't talk about how to verify the thing. And this is the piece that inside of your Kubernetes cluster will go in and say, okay, I see that your image is signed. I need it to be signed by this, uh, by this key, and I need it to be stored from this registry, and then I need to verify that at the last second. So when this creates an admission controller in Kubernetes that says, like, when I pull down an image, I'm going to check its signature, and I'm going to say yes or no whether or not I should go in. Um, this is a really simple thing that, again, is like super easy to run. If you just wanted to do this command of like helm install, connoisseur, helm atomic, blah, 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 create its own namespace in your cluster, it'll set up all the uh, admission controllers for you that you need to do, and it'll just start verifying. Not, it won't verify like in this command like which signature, it'll just verify that a signature uh, exists on the, on the image. So you can go back and set a policy on like which signatures you want. So this is just proof that like, if you take the official Hello World image, all of them are signed by Docker now, as opposed to like some sketchy one that I built. It'll say, like, I've got no key for that, and I haven't been signing that one. So putting this all together, I've talked about like a bunch of case studies. I've talked about, like, OK, here's how we can kind of uh, solve some of this stuff. But it's really about drawing the whole picture of the supply chain. Because um, this is your supply chain, but this is actually all the different vectors of the supply chain. There's, there's, there's so many ways that an attacker can get in. So again, red teaming was so much easier uh, job than trying to defend this, against this stuff. But before I start coming in and saying like, here's what you need to do, um, I thought I should step back and say like, um, security B-sides was designed to be like an interactive thing. So it's not designed to be like, I'm going to dictate and go like, tell you what you should do. How many people here, this is their first B-sides at all? Awesome. Oh, wow. So, so Matt was saying in the beginning, like, the difference between B-Sides and RSA and, like, why B-Sides existed was, like, RSA was, like, this vendor conference. It was just selling, like, snake oil. They would do these super short presentations of, like, 15 minutes long, and they just said, like, hey, go install my product, and that was the talk. And people started getting frustrated, and they are just like, well, screw this. I'm going to go build my own conference, and we're going to be focused on community stuff, focus on the attendees facilitate this discussion. So they'll do like longer talks like this and then just like have more interaction and, and get uh, technical and get vendor agnostic and just solve things like as an industry. So um, I wanted to like break out just like, how are you all solving supply chain? Or what are the threats that you're concerned about? And what can we talk about like right now that, that would, would actually change the industry, do you think? I know it's scary, but I need let's let's get some interaction. Like, what are the what are the supply chain threats that that we are actually worried about in our day to day jobs? Yeah, no, like, yeah, an, an old container that just hasn't been updated. And, Exactly. It's just riddled with vulnerabilities. You've got criticals that have just been there from, from five years ago. They haven't been patched. You've got no visibility. You don't, you don't know how to do it. Yeah. I mean, how do we solve that? How have other people solved that? This is like vulnerability management. I know, I know some of the people in this room do vulnerability management. So let's, let's hear someone daring enough to, to, to pipe in. What's that? Firewall? 
virtual vulnerability management of the containers? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, it can, it's tough to hear people, but I think you're saying like uh, get patches for the replacement to, to replace. Yeah. That's not a conversation you're going to have with the developer. That's a conversation you're going to have with the developer. Exactly. You need infrastructure to be able to patch and replace. You need an inventory probably of like tell me all the CVEs for my product uh, and then like how do I actually go and patch them. Maybe the developers aren't going to know how. Maybe the developers in the container world, they, they can. They just need to get guidance on like which ones are outdated. What other like how do you how do you manage the issue of like okay I've got a container image it's like uh, using some node thing it's got like 10,000 dependencies and you go well there's 500 CVEs for this thing but uh, I have no idea if they're impacting me and also there's not like it's already running the latest version I, I can't patch all of these things right how do how do people handle the risk of, of running this thing How do you accept and say like, okay, I don't want these five critical CVs, but I guess these four critical CVs are okay. How do you tell the business? Yeah, I think he's saying like, yeah, analyze it, look at look at the situation, make it kind of case by case, or like do risk analysis of the thing. Yeah, you can't have a unilateral policy that just says like no CVEs, like that doesn't exist. So yeah, so have a case by case risk analysis, let the business understand the risk. Okay. What are what are you investing in right now? Like where you've got you've got ten thousand dollars. Where do you spend that money to solve supply chain? I think you're saying, you know, invest in templates and invest in like standardization, like best practices first. You, developer training, I assume, like going that direction of like, here's how we want you to do it. We'll add in controls eventually, but we don't want to have like, you know, a cost on developer experience to just say like, here's this super restrictive stuff that just pisses everybody off. Let's just tell them the right way to do it and then kind of audit maybe like the when they're doing it wrong and kind of help them. Yeah. Sure. I think it's a great takeaway of like the developers want to do the right thing. They don't necessarily know how, you know, but if you can guide them in the right direction or give them feedback when they're screwing something up as opposed to blocking them, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah.
I appreciate the conversation. I, I ask you all to go ask your neighbors what they're doing for supply chain stuff and, and continue the conversation because the industry doesn't know how to solve this. And if I stand up here in front of you and say like, this is how you do it, I'm gonna be wrong. And I definitely am gonna be wrong about your environment. So, push it. I, I totally agree. Gold and blessed containers, yeah. I, I'm not with you about like trust the government on it part, but I, I get the I get the intent. Yeah, but yeah, I, I totally agree. Like organizations could be thinking about like building containers from scratch or coming kind of through, which is something. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these just in the interest of time. Um, so you go like, okay, I've talked about a bunch of stuff. Where where do I start? Which one's like the the most bang for my buck? I just want to point out like signed images for containers. Like it's so much value into into say like. I just have a signed, uh, uh, a signed image. This is how it works. I use Cosign. We haven't talked about SBOM stuff today. We haven't talked about Intoto because we're not there yet. Like most organizations are just like, I should start having like signed artifacts, right? But I, I want to I wanna have those reproducible build conversations like uh, uh, in the future. This is kind of the tech stack that I've been summarizing. Like here's, here's your existing, uh, you know, software supply chain environment. Maybe you've bought Sneak, maybe you've bought uh, GitHub, maybe you've got like Chain Garden Force. Uh, maybe you've got open policy agent, but here's, here's kind of the tech stack that you, can, you should be thinking about, specifically uh, Cosign. If you want more information, this is super useful. The CNCF has two documents. One is like software supply chain best practices. Cool. It's like a, a vast thing to go over. The other one is this one that just came out uh, last week, which is they've built a like fake software, a secure software factory saying like, here's how you should produce uh, a, a secure software. Here's the best case scenario. They made, you know, it's kind of like a, a case study in this fake organization that they built and how they solved the problem. So again, tactically, cosign, document how everything works, have centralized uh, uh, dependencies, a place like where all your dependencies come from, as opposed to like random places on the internet, and then harden your CI. Right? You, you, if you, you if you just need to solve the threats today, that's what you do. Strategically, it's salsa. Salsa, salsa, salsa. Like that's that's kind of the core goal. Provenance of like proving what built what when, how did it come from, where did it come from, proving that like the binary that you that you just ran in your production environment actually came from things something that you trust, and then just isolate everything. Like that's just like basically my career has just been like isolate it, make it ephemeral, and then stop caring about it because it can't can't impact you anymore. So talked about case studies, talked about how Kubernetes is kind of a substantial portion of the supply chain. I'm trying to paint a picture of like long-term efforts into sign artifact, policy gates, salsa maturity framework, attestation stuff. Um, the way that my presentations work is if you give me feedback on my talks, I give you these slides. Uh, so if you want to scan this or go to this form, give me some feedback on what you thought about this talk so I can kind of iterate and, and improve upon it, uh, uh, you get a copy of the slides. Questions and comments? I think that's my time anyways, so thanks very much for joining. <laughs>